Matt, your old friend Dominic here with AmericanCasinoGuide.com. Let's learn about hand ranks, because it really doesn't matter what variant of poker you're playing, at a showdown, you're gonna measure your hand ranks to see who actually wins. The lowest hand rank is the high card. This means that you have at least five cards and they do not share the same suit, do not form a ranking series like two to six, and do not share a rank with one another, forming a pair or better. When you find yourself in a desperate situation, you better pray you find yourself with an ace, because as the name implies, it's the high card that wins. Nothing beats it. Pair beats ace. Now, just above the high card is the pair. Now, this happens when two of your five cards share a rank. For example, the Ace of Diamonds and the Ace of Spades. This is a pair and a rather good one because in case you have two players with just a pair, it's always the player with the bigger pair that wins. Huh, that's just lazy writing. After the pair is two pair. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this is when you have two pairs. Like this nice situation right here where I have aces and kings. So after two pair is three of a kind. This is where you have three of the same ranking cards. So for example, three fives and then you have two other unpaired cards. Three fives. <laughs> so with those lower hands explained, the next highest hand is the straight. And this is where you have five cards that form a ranking series. So for example, 10, jack, queen, king, ace. This is called an ace high straight and beats pretty much every other straight out there because in case of two or more players having a straight, it always goes to the player with the higher ranking straight. So after the straight comes the flush, and this is where all five of your cards in the hand share the same suit. In this case, diamonds. In a situation where two players have a flush, you're gonna have to compare your hands like a high card scenario, so whoever has the higher ranking card in their flush wins. Now after the flush comes the full house. This is where you have a three of a kind and a two of a kind, or a pair. Like this one here, where I have the Olsen twins and their three dads. This is pretty much beats everything out there except for the next two hands. Now, the four of a kind is pretty self-explanatory. This is where you have all four of the same ranked card in your hand. Four aces, I win! Last but not least is the best possible play hand you can have. This is the straight flush, which is like the great white of hands because the only thing that can defeat a straight flush is a bigger straight flush. For this, you're gonna need to have both a straight and a flush, an unbroken ranking series of cards all of the same suit, like this one right here. And this is commonly referred to a royal flush and is the biggest flush you can possibly have. Nothing beats it. I think I have what they refer to as a royal flush. The easiest way to explain hand ranks and ties is to start at the bottom and work our way up. And when it comes to the bottom, there's nothing lower than the highest card. So start off by comparing your highest ranked card with your opponent. If by some stroke of sick misfortune, their high card is the same as yours, you go to the next highest card. If that happens to be a tie as well, you can ask what have you done to rot God's anger? Well, it was nice to meet you, God. Oh, and by the way, you suck. But you have to continue down the line until you determine who is the actual winner. Now there's something important to remember here that applies to every single poker hand. If there is some miraculous twist of terrible fate where you and your opponent have identical hands with respect to card ranks, it is a tie and a split pot, meaning the pot is split evenly between you. If the pot cannot be evenly split perfectly because, for example, it has an odd number, the remaining money rolls into the next pot automatically. So let's move on to pairs. In the event that two or more players have a hand with the same ranked pair, you need to compare the highest ranked unpaired card in each player's hand to determine a winner. And you'll continue working towards the lowest ranked unpaired card if you continue to tie. Remember that identical hands result in a split pot. For you and you and me, $367,000 each. Now when it comes to three of a kind ties, you compare the highest ranked unpaired card in each player's hand to determine the winner just like you would with a high card or pair scenario. I'm gonna clarify now my last statement before I get a bunch of people telling me I made a mistake and that players can't have the same three of a kind because that would mean you're playing with six cards of each rank. My answer to that is there are many variations of poker that have players sharing cards for their showdown hands like Texas Hold'em. And you could even be using wild cards for some reason. So honestly, it's unlikely to happen that two players will both have a tied three of a kind but it could happen, so I thought I'd better mention it. It's not totally impossible. So moving on, when it comes to straights, the winner is always the player with the highest ranking series.
So the only way to tie with a straight is to have the same straight as your opponent. And in the event that you both have the same straight, you split the pot. There's really no further comparison. In situations where two or more players have a flush, it's the player with the highest ranked card in their flush that wins. You'll be comparing card ranks like a high card scenario to determine the winner from highest to lowest. Now, when it comes to a full house, you have to compare the rank of the three of the kind first, and then the pair. Again, if you have an identical hand with respect to pairs and card ranks, it's a split pot. The four of a kind should seem pretty self-evident at this point. Just compare the rank of the paired cards, and if those are tied, yes, you guessed it, check the unpaired card, and the highest card wins. Last but not least is the great white. the straight flush. It operates just like a straight, so just compare who has the bigger one. And in the case of a true tie, split the pot and cry into your pillow. Gonna cry? So I get a lot of questions about betting. So for that reason, I decided to dedicate part four of our 13 part series on poker to blinds and antes, hopefully explaining the basics of betting in the process. So let's begin with what is an ante? Simply put, it's a mandatory bet or wager that you'll find in stud and draw poker games that each player is obligated to make before getting any cards or participating in the hand. Essentially, if you want to play, you gotta pay. Now poker. The ante is usually a singular unit and should be the smallest value allowed at the table, typically $1, unless you're playing higher or lower stakes, or perhaps you're participating in some kind of tournament with antes that increase over time. Without an ante, pots would be smaller, and ultimately you would have no financial incentive to play your weak hands and could just fold and get out of a hand at no risk. I fold. What do you mean you fold? Hey, come on, what is this? Antes entice players to stay in the hand, increasing the pot size, and overall making the game more enjoyable and more interesting for everyone. When it comes to Texas Hold'em though, or its crazy cousin Omaha, things are a bit different. Antes are replaced with the small and big blinds. And blinds function in much the same way as antes and pretty much serve the same exact purpose with just a few notable differences. The biggest difference is that unlike antes, where every player at the table is obligated to make one before the hand, only two players, the player to the left of the dealer, who is the small blind, and the one to the left of them, the big blind, need to make a wager before cards are dealt. This mandatory pre-hand bet is why they are called blinds because these players are the only players who must wager money before seeing their cards. Hence, they are going into the hand blind. The other big difference is that blinds are not equal. The big blind is actually twice the amount of the small, hence the big and small monikers. And like antes, change in value in tournament play as time goes on. The important thing to remember is that the dealer position will pass left at the conclusion of every hand moving the big and small blinds with it. Now it's your turn. Understanding the lengthy list of betting terminology and what it all means is one of the biggest hurdles for new players. So let's begin with one of the most basic and popular terms in all of poker, action. Action, action. I can't hear in here. Now action can either refer to a betting action a player takes or as a term for the number of bets, calls, and raises already in the pot. So if someone says there's a lot of action in this pot, it means there's a lot of betting and raises involved, and there's quite a bit of money already in the middle of the table. So let's talk a little bit about betting actions while we're at it. There are six possible options. Check, bet, call, fold, raise, and of course, all in. Rams, hogs, dogs, chicken, turkeys, rabbits, you name it! So a check is when you pass the action to the player on your left without actually placing a wager first. This is only possible if no one has previously placed a bet before you or if you simply are the first to act. Check. So after the check is the bet. A bet is a declaration of a wager you're making in a betting round on a particular hand. Bets can only be made if you are the first to act in a round or if all players before you have already checked. Once a player places a bet, they are essentially challenging the other players and forcing them to act accordingly. I'm gonna show you how. King says bet. So the first thing you can do is make a call. No, 
get that phone out of here. It's not that kind of call. A call in poker is simply when you match a bet or match a raise. An individual betting round ends when all players have placed the same betting amount into the pot. And in cases where no one calls your bet or your raise, you'll win the pot outright. Now the flip side to a call is the fold. It's usually made in response to a bet or a raise where you decide a particular hand is not worth the gamble. When you fold, it means that you have forfeited the hand and any money you have already contributed to the pot. Keep in mind that when you fold, your hand will no longer be revealed at the showdown and you're basically out until the next hand. Bear? Yeah, I fold. So the raise is similar to the call where you stay in the hand by placing a bet. Only difference here is that you also are increasing the bet and therefore challenging the challengers. And players can respond to a raise with either a call, a fold, or another raise, commonly referred to as a re-raise. I'll raise 2,000. More often than not, raising is associated with either a strong hand or a bluff. And finally, all in. Play enough Texas Hold'em and you will definitely hear about this one. It's a bet and raise action where you declare your intention to wager the entirety of your chip stack on the table to either cover the existing bet or to put other players in for more. It is honestly the most volatile and exciting moment in gambling and something we will discuss in more detail in our video covering betting strategies. 40,500,000 all in. To become a pro at betting, you're gonna to need to remember three basic things. Knowing your cards, your position at the table, and most importantly, how to present your strengths and weaknesses to your opponents. Now, I might sound a little philosophical here, but when it comes to basic betting strategy, knowing is half the battle. The most fundamental skill that every player needs is the ability to know what hands are possible by looking at their own cards, plus all the community cards. Yeah. Or no. In other words, you need to know at a glance what you're holding, the potential combinations you can make from the cards, and most importantly, what your opponent could or couldn't have based on the cards in the center and the blocker cards you're holding. For example, if there's no potential for three or more community cards to be connected into a straight, you can rule that hand out right away. If there are no paired cards in the center, nobody can have a full house. And when there are less than three cards sharing a suit, nobody can have a flush. But remember, this goes double for you. So don't go around pretending to hold a big hand when you could not possibly have one based on these observations. The next thing I wanna talk about is position because your position at the table is everything. Besides the blind positions that we've covered previously, we're also gonna be talking about the under the gun position or UTG, middle as well as late positions. UTG players are positioned immediately to the left of the big blind and are the first to act pre-flop. Now, if you play aggressively in this position, you can shake out a few weak hand holders and even potentially fold out those in the blinds pre-flop if your raise is big enough. But early position hands should mainly consist of high pocket pairs or high value suited connectors. Think pocket jacks to pocket aces or even ace king, ace queen suited. These kinds of hands. When you're in that position, these are what you're looking for. Always be on the tight side with your raising in early position as you may have potential callers waiting to act after you before any community cards are actually dealt. Now, players in middle positions should also raise with a narrow range, but they should be perceptive to the actions of the players in late positions. Middle position is where you should consider opening up your playable hand range. And also, look for opportunities to act aggressively when late position players fold before or on the flop, and now you find yourself to be the de facto late position player. Late position is where you're likely going to be making the most money. Players in this late position act last in each post-flop round, and this is a massive advantage as they can examine everyone's actions before it's their turn to act and act accordingly. Remember that when you get passive and tight opponents in the blinds or in the UTG position, aggressive play is a very effective and profitable strategy. And finally, once you know the cards in play and your position, decide how you want to present strength or possibly weakness at the table. If you want to show dominance and get people to fold, raising pre-flop is recommended, but can also be equally effective post-flop if you're in the right position to act. In the early pre- and post-flop rounds, acting like you already have a strong hand can make players fold if they're holding a weak pair or an undeveloped hand. 
That is, of course, if the raise is sized and timed properly. Getting players to fold preflop increases your chances of winning a hand, as you now have fewer people who may find themselves with the winning hand after limping into the river. That said, minimum betting, checks, and limped calls also tend to signify hesitation and weakness. Playing in this way allows you to maximize the value from your made hand or give yourself another full betting round to improve your holding before committing a lot of chips. Remember though, how you play is completely up to you and it's a personal choice of what cards you have and how comfortable you are making a wager. Now the most important thing to think about when bluffing is knowing when and where to do it. When and where? You can bluff from any position, but not all positions are alike. For example, if you bluff early, you may get an unwanted call from a player who has yet to reveal their intention to play the hand. Bluff call. That's why the best place to be is in late position or on the button. From there, you can get to see what everyone is doing and take your action last and accordingly. There are four tells that can help you identify if anyone is showing interest in a hand. Is anyone betting aggressively? Did someone change their body language? Is someone raising more than the blind bet? Is everyone just checking after the flop? Knowing if someone is keen to stick around is a necessity for calculating your next move. If nobody makes a move, acting like you have a good hand by betting on the flop and then following this up with a strong turn continuation bet can shake out most of the players, even those holding something potentially better than yours. Good bluff. This kind of aggressive play can have a real good chance of you taking the hand without having to go to a showdown, which of course is an excellent result. Now, how big does a bet need to be to shake out the suckers? Well, your wager amount needs to be based on the number of potential callers and their perceived play versus their likelihood to fold percentage. When there's just one opponent, anything around half the pot should be sufficient. But if betting into two or three opponents, you will normally require a bet equal to at least two thirds or even the full value of the pot to convey any real aggression. This is why I recommend a pot size bet or larger in this type of situation. A bet of this size is big enough to not appear weak and manageable, but small enough that you're hopefully not staying taking everything on a single hand. But what happens if someone else wants to spoil the party and take down the hand for themselves? The first thing that you're gonna to need to assess is your opponent's plausible holdings from the community cards dealt combined with the aggression of their betting actions. All in. Also, factor in your own hand's relative strength and ask yourself, is it strong enough to stand up against continued aggression? Then balance the chance of your opponent remaining in the hand versus the likelihood of them bluffing. Next up, ask yourself how invested you are in this hand because things are about to get dicey. And finally, be in a position and believe in your hand. When pushing back and trying to get other players off a hand, you need to show a level of confidence to make it seem believable. Look confident, yeah. In other words, the story has to make sense. If you're running a stone cold bluff and the story simply doesn't add up, the whole thing is likely to fall apart and a good player will easily sniff this out. Now watch your money disappear. Don't what? make out like you have a monster when the community cards say otherwise. Also, be sure to employ the right body language to throw others off the scent and convince them you really do hold a winning hand. Ultimately, remember, you are playing a mind game rooted in statistical probability. Use this probability as a weapon to convince someone you have a big hand and let your chips do the talking. Now, if you've watched our previous episodes, you know that there's a lot of information you can apply directly to Texas Hold'em, but there are still a few specifics that I'll need to lay down before throwing you out into the cold, you know, dropping you off in the deep end. You got the same big hand. So let's start off with the simple stuff. Blinds. Blinds are mandatory bets placed by the first two players to act at the start of the game. In Texas Hold'em, the dealer holds the usual button or dealer button marker, and the player to the dealer's left holds the small blind button, and the player to the left of the small blind has to wager the big blind because they have the big blind button. Both of them must pay before any cards are actually dealt. Now, the value of the blinds are determined by the casino or the tournament in question, but the thing to remember is that the big blind is always going to be double the amount of the small blind. 
Okay, so following the small and big blind bet, two cards will be dealt to all players at the table and the round will begin. Each player in turn will need to decide whether to fold, raise, or call the big blind in order to stay in the game. So after the betting rounds are over and the next round begins, the dealer button, the small blind, and the big blind positions will all be moved one player to the left. Next up, betting options. This is pretty much a no-brainer as everything remains the same as you see in typical poker variations, meaning you have the typical fold, check, bet, call, or raise actions. But Texas Hold'em includes the always magnificent, the always terrifying, and many times wrongly used all-in bet. All-in. Oh. Big head. <laughs> All bets aside, let's move on to how cards are actually dealt. Now, pre-flop, players will receive two face-down cards in front of them called their hole cards. And after seeing their cards, each player will be able to call or raise that big blind. The betting action begins to the player to the left of the big blind. This player is free to bet, fold, call, or raise. So once this player acts, the betting round continues clockwise until all active players have made equal bets or have folded. Keep in mind that the blind players act last in the pre-flop round. And even if everyone calls that big blind bet, the big blind player will still have the last action to check or raise. Following the pre-flop is the flop itself. At this stage, three community cards will be dealt face up onto the table. Betting on the flop begins from the player to the left of the dealer, who was previously the small blind. And this is where all rounds will start here on in, except for that pre-flop round that I already discussed. The betting options here are almost identical, the only difference being that since no bets have been put on the round, like the blind rounds, players can check and pass their turns until someone bets. Check. Check. If all players check the hand, it moves to the next round. So after the flop round, we have the turn, in which one more card will be dealt face up onto the table. This will be the fourth community card, and in Hold'em, this is sometimes referred to as the fourth street or the turn. Once all players still in the hand have had a chance to take an action, the next betting round begins, again from the player to the left of the button. The final betting round is referred to as the river or fifth street, and this is where the fifth community card is dealt face up. And it's important to remember that betting rules here will remain the same as they did in the flop and turn round. Last but not least, my favorite moment, the one that separates that prey from predator, that sheep from the lion, the winners from the losers. You mean a showdown? The showdown. So when the final betting round is complete and there's more than one active player still in the hand, the last player to bet or raise has to show their cards. If there was no bet in the final round, the first player still in the hand to the left of the dealer has to show their cards first. Now naturally the player with the best five cards wins the pot, and in the case of a tie, the pot is split equally. Keep in mind Texas Hold'em rules state that all suits are equal, so if two or more players have the same hand rank but with different suits, it's still a tie unlike some other poker variations out there. Now, one of the most fundamental skills you need to have in Texas Hold'em is knowing when to play a hand based on its potential strength. Thinking like six steps ahead. You are not gonna be getting pocket pairs every time cards are dealt. When playing a game of Texas Hold'em, you need to be ready to make a decision pre-flop. Understanding your two hole cards and what they can say about your chances of winning overall will help you make the right decision at the right time. The playable range you allow yourself is a personal decision and one you really should adjust based on factors like table position, chip stack, and of course your own personal playing style. And I do mean aggressive, that's your style, Professor. I've talked about this in previous episodes, but it's worth noting that tight play is typically the advice you get from top level tournament players who, like I said, play a very limited range of hands. Simply put, you cannot play every hand, and even good players are gonna fold perceivably good cards. Fold, fold, fold. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about high-ranking cards, you know, preferably ones that are connected and or suited. Now, these kinds of hands are great for raising late position, because they have real potential to hit on the flop and work themselves into a strong hand. However, they can be broken pretty easily by a bad flop. Essentially, they are drawing hands and still need a lot of help to win at the showdown. Although Ace-King is tier one, it is nothing but a high card until paired with an Ace or a King, as it can be beaten by anyone with a pair of twos. In that same vein, an Ace by itself does not make a good hand. Without a strong kicker, an Ace is just a high card and is ultimately a drawing hand. My recommendation, stick to pocket pairs and connectors that rank between eight and ace. With starting hands like these, 
you can comfortably raise pre-flop regardless of position or number of callers. This style of play is commonly referred to as tight aggressive and is the default mode that I and a lot of professional poker players use unless circumstances like chip stack or table position dictate a change in tactics. Very aggressive. Now when it comes to whole cards, it doesn't get much better than pocket pairs. But unsurprisingly, we don't play premium pairs the same way we play the middle or bottom pairs. Now premium pairs have the highest probability of paying out, and generally speaking, should be raised pre-flop regardless of position. My advice, avoid slow play unless you have monstrous whole cards like pocket aces. Now pocket queens or kings can be good as well, but still can be bested by anyone who pairs up an ace, so be careful. Think about it. For a similar reason, pocket jacks that can be beaten by a paired ace, paired king, or paired queen should only be raised pre-flop when you don't have callers out front. Now, when it comes to middle or bottom pairs, the power really is in pulling a surprise set post-flop and then pushing in heavy with three of a kind or a strong two pair in mid position or later. Remember, when raising pre-flop with a bottom pair, even in late position with no callers out front, it's essentially a bluff, as what you're really looking for is to push out the other players and avoid a call altogether. Hey. Despite potentially winning the hand and of course the blind money, this is not a money making tactic. And when holding mid to bottom pairs, it's best you avoid raising pre-flop and instead wait to see what shapes up. Wait for it. We're turning the tables and we're gonna be analyzing the worst ones possible. Now, a very common beginner mistake you might have made yourself is playing an ace. Although such a hand may occasionally land you a win, it's not always a good old reliable hand. So if you're dealt an offsuit ace and a low card, odds are you'll be beaten by other players who hold suited aces or or high cards, or any combination of low, high card pairs. So in a hand with more than four players and a big raise out in front of you, the smartest decision would be just to fold. Do it, do it. Now, this concept also applies when you're dealt an unsuited face card plus a low card. I mean, it also applies if you're holding any of these starting hands, 4-7, 4-8, 5-8, 3-6. If you have these, good luck, my friend. He will need help. The probability of landing a win with these cards is extremely low, especially when unsuited. So even if you are super lucky and land a full house, your hand would be easily beaten by plenty of other higher cards. However, if you're in one of the blind positions, you can go ahead and play the first round before reassessing how your hand holds up on the flop. Now holding a deuce, three or four with a nine is also a major red flag. Why you ask? Well, because that nine would be the only thing that may potentially keep you from drowning in this hand. If you're nine pairs, you'll have middle pair. But unfortunately, this can still be hulked by players holding premium pairs, jacks, queens, kings, or the mother of them all, aces. Worse yet, you'll be relying on some help from the board just to make a straight with these cards. Then there's the infamous 3-8 and 3-7. Trying to form a decent hand, especially a straight with either of these cards is extremely hard. Real hard, harder than a cow patty in a January morning. I mean, sure, you might actually still get a pair, but keep in mind that these are low pairs, resulting in a very bad hand nonetheless. The worst possible starting hand though, known to mankind is the dreaded seven deuce, off suit. I mean, it's very difficult to form an actual good hand with these cards. And even if you end up forming a decent hand, you're unlikely to win considering just how low the card values are and how likely it is that someone has something better. The exact same applies when dealt to eight off suit. It's only marginally better than seven deuce. To sum things up, the worst hands in poker are unpaired, unsuited, and unconnected cards of a low rank that cannot possibly form a straight. At the end of the day, any cards can form a winning hand with enough luck, skill, and a good bluff. So good luck. So let's start off with a brief definition. What is live dealer poker? What is it? Well, it's basically poker that you play online in real time with a live dealer. It features your usual poker table, deck of cards, you name it, it's all there. All you'd have to do is sit at the table you desire, place your bet, 
interact with the dealer if you want, and just play away. The best thing about this though, is that you can play from literally anywhere in the world at any time you like. But let's get into the really fun part of it. If you don't know which live dealer poker variation is for you, don't worry, because there's quite a good selection of games you can choose from. The most well-known variations are Live Casino Hold'em, Live Caribbean Stud Poker, and Live Three Card Poker. Live Dealer Poker comes with some unique differences though when comparing it to regular poker. The biggest is that you play against the house instead of other players, like you would with Blackjack. Not against each other, no? The dealer doesn't check their cards until they actually have to, which is usually after you call or fold your cards. And just like in other casino games where you're playing against the house, Live Dealer Poker offers high payout side bets as well as progressive jackpots, so you can win big while just throwing around some cards. Although it may seem as if it's only you and the dealer in the room, there are other players present also playing against the dealer. You are not in this alone. And you can interact with them and the dealer through the use of the chat box if you still want that social aspect of poker. On that note, you may be wondering that this sounds a lot like online poker. So why give it a fancy name of live dealer poker? Well, that's because a lot of people confuse live dealer poker with online poker. I myself am actually guilty of this. So this is very important to remember if you actually want to start playing this variation. Here are the main differences between the two variations. As I previously mentioned, when playing live dealer poker, you get to play against the house, not against players. And also, the dealer and the cards are real, not simulated. In other words, the game is simultaneously live streamed for all players around the world. So if you want to play, having a good internet connection is a must. Sheldor back online. <laughs> when it comes to overall popularity, Omaha is Texas Hold'em's biggest competitor. This is mainly because of the uniquely different play style and experience it has to offer. You have higher chances of landing bigger hands. What? That's a flush. Therefore increasing the excitement level that players experience and making betting rounds far more dynamic. Now the fundamental differences between playing Omaha and Texas Hold'em is nothing other than the number of hole cards you're dealt and how to use them to make your final hand in the showdown. In Texas Hold'em, you get two cards, but in Omaha, you're dealt four. You must use two of these cards to create a five card hand with the community cards in the center. In other words, in Hold'em, you're free to use as many or as few whole cards and community cards as you want in order to construct your hand. Where in Omaha, it's two. Always two there are. No more, no less. Regardless of this, normal rules apply here and the player with the highest ranked hand is the one who wins and eventually takes the pot. My advice to you is to carefully consider the number of players still in the round and the cards in your hand before making a bet or making a call. Remember that every player has four cards and the likelihood of having a high hand is exponentially higher than it is in Texas Hold'em. Also make sure to pay close attention to your blocker cards as they can really prevent or limit the combinations your opponent can make to beat your hand. Cards in your hole may not necessarily help your hand construction, but may still decrease your opponent's odds of making that set or that flush. In my opinion, this version of poker is great for new players trying to understand how to build a hand. High stakes, big bucks. Now, Omaha comes in a lot of variations, but in this video, we're going to stick to pot limit and no limit variations. So before buying in, make sure you know the version of the game that you're actually playing. The difference is quite straightforward. Pot limit is more evenly paced and better suited for low stakes players just starting out as it restricts the amount of chips that a player may make or raise in a hand. But personally, Personally, I prefer the no limit variation. There's no betting cap whatsoever, and you get to say all in and potentially make or ruin your day. All in. Omaha High Low is in my opinion, perfect for any player who just is starting out or for anyone who would like to spice up their usual Hold'em gameplay. I really love how familiar Omaha feels but at the same time, how divergent your betting strategies become. What's important though, and what sets Omaha High Low apart is how the showdown works and that split pot idea that comes in the showdown. Essentially, when the final round of betting finishes, the hands are built and compared in the showdown like normal to see who has the highest ranked hand. But there is a twist. After determining the winner, there's a second showdown. Here, players construct and compare hands again 
but this time the round will go to the lowest ranked hand. Each of the winners from both showdowns are gonna take half the total pot. Split pot, gentlemen. Now when it comes to the low hand showdown, it's a bit more complex than the first one. But don't worry, I'm gonna keep it simple. To qualify for a low hand, you need to have eight high or lower, with the ace actually being the lowest ranked cards you can have this time around. You're free to use any two cards you desire from the four cards that you were dealt. It's practically the same process that you went through with the high hand, selecting two cards from your hole and three from the community. Now, but you can use the same two cards as before, or you can use the other two or any combination in between. Just take the other three cards from the community pool and build your five card hand. When qualifying for the low round, remember that straights and flushes do not count as straights and flushes, they just count as a high card. If multiple players qualify for the low hand, the winning hand is determined by which player has the lowest high card. In the low hand, the best possible hand you can possibly have is a five, four, three, two, and ace, typically called the wheel. And this is normally a straight, but remember, in low, it counts as just high card. And if there's no qualifying low hand, the high hand wins the entire pot. And if you manage to win both halves of the pot, this is commonly referred to as scoop or scooping the pot and really needs to be your end goal. You gotta tell me what your goal is. What do you want? If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, let us know in the comment section down below. And while you're at it, click and clack that like button and pound that big red subscribe button if you haven't already. And don't forget to ring it, ding, ding that notification bell. Guys, my name is Dominic, wishing you luck and reminding you as always, play responsibly.